Okay, so I have to start with um, our carbohydrates. And I'm going to give this information in small doses. So to begin with, the carbohydrates, um, if you've taken chemistry, which I know you have, you notice that you'll know that carbohydrates are hydrated carbon. So it has a carbon plus a water because when you hydrate something, you add water to it. So carbohydrates tend to have one carbon, two hydrogens, and an oxygen. And then you multiply them all by however many carbons are in the chain. Okay. So they typically have those types of formulas. So if it's a a, um, a triose, it would be C three H six O three. Okay. If it's a hexose. C six H twelve O six. Okay. Does that does that make sense to you? So you keep multiplying out all of your all of your numbers. Um so there are aldoses and there are ketoses um for two types of two types of these simple carbons, okay, these simple carbohydrates, sorry. Um, and the aldose has a terminal carbonyl group, which is be the aldehyde group. And the ketose has the carbonyl group smack dab in the middle between two different carbon chains, okay? So the carbonyl group is at the end for an aldose and in the middle for a ketose. I probably will not ask you that question. Just saying. Okay. Um, the size of the base carbons, a triose has three carbons, a tetrose has four carbons, a pentose has five carbons, a hexose has six carbons. That you probably need to know. Um, Two of the pentoses that you should know off the top of your head, ribose and deoxyribose, right? That are integral in making your RNA and your DNA. Hexose, uh, we have glucose, very, very common. We know this guy inside and out, hopefully by now. If not, you've eaten plenty of them, guaranteed. So, <clears throat> Um, carbohydrates have different ways that they are arranged and there's, and all of our organic chemistry compounds have this, the stereo iso isometry. Okay. So they have stereo isomers where they are mirror images of each other. So there's a D form and there's an L form. And if you have ever been in the vitamin aisle um, or nutritional supplement aisle, you'll notice you probably all looked and saw L-valine, L-lysine, L-arginine. Um, I'm trying to think of all the other ones that are up there. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, but they're all L's. That's because they're not from nature. Those things were manufactured in a lab. And so they put them in a little capsule and they sell them in the shelf, on the shelf. The things that appear and come from nature tend to have a D or an L chemistry. So they can be facing left or right. And, um, so if you ever see something that says that it's D something, then you know that that came from a natural source. 
it wasn't manufactured that way. Um, that's, that's the really quick down and dirty version of it. Basically, there's a left version and a right version. One's D, one's L. Um, and you should have all had or are taking organic of some sort and have learned this, I hope. Okay. Um, if not, then not to worry. Okay. There's a DNA version of every type of carbohydrate. Um, when we're looking at carbohydrates, we tend to classify them by how many units there are that are linked together. So like, okay, so you know that proteins have a whole bunch of amino acids, right? So carbohydrates also can have a whole bunch of monosaccharides, which are their individual unit, or they can have any version from 1 to 15 to 236, whatever, okay? Monosaccharides, the most common monosaccharides that we see in humans, the things that we take in, that we eat, glucose, galactose, and fructose. Okay. Um, with those three monosaccharides, we can then make disaccharides. And all of the disaccharides have at least one glucose. So for maltose, it's actually two glucoses linked together with a glycosidic bond. Okay. So maltose is two of these. Lactose is actually a glucose and a galactose together. And if you're smart and you figure this out, galactose has lactose in it. Like it has a, the word, okay? You just have to remember that galactose is the one unit and lactose is the two unit. And how do you remember that? Well, the disaccharide lactose there are a lot of people that are lactose intolerant because they can't break it down. So they can't break that glycosidic bond between the glucose and the galactose. If for some reason somebody does not is not making that enzyme, the lactase, to be able to break that down, that would make me automatically think, okay, so lactose has to be bigger than galactose, right? That's the way it works. So galactose is the monosaccharide. Lactose is made up of glucose and galactose. The last disaccharide is sucrose, and sucrose is actually your table sugar. Um, Lactose, of course, is the milk sugar that we're, we know of. Um, but sucrose has glucose and fructose that make it up. Okay. So to break down each of these disaccharides into the simplest units, which are the monosaccharides, each of these things needs to have an enzyme to be able to make that to break that glycosidic bond between the two monosaccharides. So maltose has an enzyme called maltase that breaks it down into its two individual glucoses. Lactose has an enzyme called lactase, which breaks it down into glucose and galactose. And sucrose has an enzyme called sucrase, which breaks it down into glucose and fructose, right? So each one of these 
has its own individual enzyme to be able to break it down into its most simplest parts. Why do we need those enzymes? Well, because we can't absorb disaccharides in the intestinal tract. We can only take in and absorb monosaccharides. So those monosaccharides are the things that need to be absorbed into the bloodstream so that we can utilize them for energy or for production of other carbohydrates that are more complex or something of that nature. Okay. So there are things called oligosaccharides, which means that there's just a few of them <laughs> in there. Um, and we don't talk about those much. Uh, but then we have polysaccharides, which have more than 10 monomers or monosaccharides hooked together. Um, starch, starch is something that you eat a lot. Sometimes some people eat a lot of starches, starchy foods, potatoes, potato chips, french fries, bread, crackers, cookies, cakes, all that good stuff, right? Um, so starch, some people eat a lot of starch, um, noodles, pasta, mm, okay. Um, cellulose is actually, um, starch and cellulose are both come from plants, just so you guys know. Starch is, um, the way that plants store their energy or store their glucose. It's, it's their plant store, their, of sugar. Um, so it's easily broken down. Cellulose is more of a structural carbohydrate. Um, so cellulose for us, we cannot, our cells and our intestinal tract do not actually break down cellulose. Um, there are some organisms that dwell in our intestinal tract that can help to break it down partially, but it's never really fully gone. So you guys have heard of eating things with fiber, right? And eating things with fiber helps to clear out the intestinal tract and keep things moving. Fiber is actually cellulose. So... Um, there is soluble fiber and there is insoluble fiber, and I am not going there because this is not a nutrition class. But you need to understand that cellulose and starch both come from plants. Um, one is easily broken down, one is not. Okay. Glycogen is where animals store their extra glucose. So they make, they put the glucoses together and they make a compound or a polysaccharide called glycogen. And if you remember from AMP1, glycogen is stored in your muscle cells for quick energy when we need the, the sugar, okay, when we're using our muscles hard. Um, and it is stored in the liver so that if our sugar goes too low, our liver can break down the, the glycogen and release it into the bloodstream very quickly and easily to bring our blood sugar back up. <clears throat> All right. Um, in ClinChem 1, we talked about reducing substances. Okay. Um, the carbohydrates that have that carbonyl group, either on the end or in the middle, the, the, the aldehydes or the ketones, they are able to reduce. Okay. If they don't have that carbonyl group that's at the end or in the middle, like that they don't have a ketone or an aldehyde group, then they can't reduce. Um, and to reduce, of course, is gaining electrons, so taking on hydrogens. Um, all monosaccharides and most 
of the disaccharides are considered reducing agents. So back in Clean Chem 1, we talked about having that copper sulfate um, clinic test for testing for reducing substances. So it wasn't specific for glucose, but it would find the simplest sugars. So monosaccharides and disaccharides. So that's why galactose and lactose could have been there causing it to become positive when really we wanted, we were interested in glucose. So um, we used to do that clinic test, test, that copper sulfate reducing test um, on all kids under the age of two whenever we got urines on them to make sure that they didn't have uh, galactose intolerance or galactosemia, which could be really harmful for them. Uh, <clears throat> the energy source that humans use predominantly is glucose. So even though we take in fructose and we take in galactose and we take in glucose, our bodies actually have enzymes to be able to change the structure of these to make them into glucose. I know this sounds really weird, but it, we, it does. It converts fructose to, to glucose and we use the glucose. Um, if you're familiar with glycolysis, um, in glycolysis we actually change glucose to fructose at some point, a um, couple steps in, so that then we actually have fructose. So we convert these simple carbs back and forth a lot in our bodies, in our cells. Okay. Um, the one area of the human body that could not use any other saccharide or carbohydrate besides glucose is the central nervous system. Well, the whole nervous system, all of the nervous system, your nerves, peripheral, cranial, um, and central nervous system, all the entire nervous system um, utilizes only glucose. So it is extremely important to maintain a glucose level of a certain number. Because what happens is your glucose goes too low, and you don't have any reserves, and you can't, and the things aren't working out, and you can't maintain the glucose level, you'll die. The central nervous system stops, and if the central nervous system stops, everything stops, and you will die. You'll go into a coma, you will die. D I E, die. Okay, so you always need to make sure that the glucose level is adequate. Now, for a normal person who does not have glucose fluctuations that are absolutely ridiculous, um, a glucose level that drops below 70 milligrams per deciliter is typically where the liver starts breaking down that glycogen to put the glucose units into the plasma so that then the cells can start getting sugar again and start making energy and doing what they need to do or even just respiring and making their ATP to keep them viable and alive. Some people who are really bad diabetics um, and they can't keep their sugars under control and they just have no way of making sure that this happens, 
um, their sugars can be very, very low, and they're still walking and driving, and they don't realize that their sugar is that low. Uh, one of the ladies who used to work here, her husband would, had his sugars would bottom out like super low, and he had no warning. He would be walking, talking, driving, doing whatever, and then all of a sudden he would just pass out. He didn't feel it coming on. He didn't feel lightheaded. He didn't like. He didn't get any of those signs. He would just poop over, and she would do a finger stick, and his sugar would be thirty-four. That was that's great. Three, four, thirty-four. Okay, that's way too low. That's scary. He almost died. So. He actually, when that happened way too many times, he actually ended up um, with an insulin pump because they documented how many times he passed out, what his sugars were. I mean, like they had documentation like out the wazoo to try because he had been fighting for an insulin pump with the help of his endocrinologist fighting for this insulin pump for like three years. And finally, um, when he passed out in the car, and almost wrecked into a person, then they finally wanted to give him the insulin pump. It was terrible. Terrible, terrible. So, make sure that you advocate for everybody that you love and know who might have to have problems, have some help getting things done. Okay, so, disaccharides. I already told you this, okay? Um, Glycosidic bonds are, are formed between the two monosaccharides because they're no longer hydrated. You dehydrate. It's a dehydration synthesis reaction that forms a disaccharide. Okay. So you remove a water and you form a glycosidic bond. The maltose is made up of two glucose molecules. Lactose is made up of glucose and galactose. And then sucrose is made of glucose and fructose. See, we did that already. Polysaccharides, I love this. This comes, you know, on one slide they tell you it's more than 10. This one says it's usually more than 20 and usually they are larger they're not usually 10 they're usually like 20 25 30 or more 62 whatever um typically these things are insoluble in water as i told you earlier there is a soluble cellulose okay now when it says that it's soluble cellulose it is not completely soluble it does not turn um does not completely dissociate in water, but it will um, break down partially. It um, looks kind of thin and transparent and does its thing. Right. So um, it's a little interesting. So starches. This is what I wanted to. And this is what I I need to explain to you. See see how the starches. Have all the little flags up on one side. And then cellulose, remember this is easily broken down. Cellulose has them alternating every other side. Okay. This gives rigidity on this side and, and gives... Uh, weakness on this side so it makes it easier to break it apart. This guy gives a little bit of rigidity on each side so this is more of a structural thing. Okay. Um, but starch is the one that is easily broken down. Cellulose is not. We don't have the enzymes to break down cellulose. Some of the bacteria in our gut have the ability to break down pieces and parts of cellulose, not completely get rid of it because it takes too long. Okay. 
glycogen has branches. Okay. So even though it has all of the glucoses lined up and all the flags are in one direction, it also has branches. Because when we need sugar in our cells very quickly, we can break these glycosidic bonds in the multiple locations instead of only being able to get one from this end and one from this end like we could with starch. If we're trying to break down glycogen, we can take care of this one. We can get rid of, well, this one over here. We can get rid of this one. We can get rid of, so they, all the branches can have one glucose taken out, off and we can release it out into the plasma very, very, very quickly. Okay. So this one says most common polysaccharides, starch, glycogen, cellulose, they can contain anywhere from 25 to 2,500 glucose units. Okay. And again, starch is the plant storage, glucose storage. Cellulose is the plant structure. Glycogen is animal storage of glucose. And it's very easily broken down to get multiple glucoses very quickly. Okay. So, most of the glucose that we take in are polysaccharides. They're taken in, um, in as complex carbohydrates, um, uh, or just plain old polysaccharides, which the polysaccharides, the starch, um, is easily degradable and it becomes sugars very quickly. So that if you eat a lot of starchy foods, your sugars tend to go higher than if you were to eat complex carbohydrates, which take longer to break down and work with because they have the cellulose in there as well as starch. Um, the carbohydrates that we ingest have to be converted to disaccharides and then disaccharides have to be broken down to monosaccharides before they can be absorbed into the cells or moved into the cells, transported into the cells across the cell membrane to be utilized by the cells. Okay. <clears throat> How do they get to the cells from the GI tract? Well, A, they get absorbed by the intestinal epithelial cells, those mucosal cells, those um, columnar epithelial cells that you learned about in AP1. Um, and they get absorbed in there and then they go through there and get into the bloodstream. So they cross the epithelium of the mucosal membrane of the GI tract, and then the epithelium, that single epithelial layer or endothelial layer of the um, capillaries that are surrounding the intestines and then they get into the plasma. So they have to cross two epithelial cells at least to get into the plasma. Now, once they get into the plasma, all of the blood from your GI tract goes through the hepatic portal vein to the liver because the liver wants to see what exactly did you ingest? Is there anything toxic that I need to deal with? Um, is it all healthy stuff that we're good, okay with? Can we let this go? What, what did you take in? So <clears throat> the liver will allow a good portion of your, your sugars to move out into the bloodstream. Um, and then if once your sugar reaches a certain level, your pancreas is going to start throwing some insulin out there so that then your cells start taking that sugar back into them. Okay. All of the cells of your body start taking sugar in. 
hey, it's feeding time, guys, at the zoo. There's the stuff. Now you got it. So the all of your cells will start taking in sugar because insulin tells it to. They're told by insulin, take the sugar in. Now, if they have far too much sugar in them already, then they're not going to want to take in any more sugar, right? So what will happen is that once your cells have reached an excessive amount of sugar, or there's too much and we can't handle any more, then your pancreas is like, okay, everybody's got their full fill. We have... We still have excess sugar out there, and too much sugar in the bloodstream can be really bad for somebody. So now we're going to produce glucagon. Okay. And glucagon will then say, oh, it's time to um, release sugar. It's, you know, we got to drop that sugar back down. Okay. And we store it. And how do we store sugar in our bodies? As glycogen. Glycogen is stored in muscle cells and in the liver. So, glucose, once it enters into the cell, it's shunted into one of three metabolic pathways. We have the MDMeyerhoff pathway, which of course is your glycolytic pathway. Um, you have your hexose monophosphate shunt or pathway, um, which you learned about in hematology. And you have a glycogen or glycogen production pathway. So you're either going to use your sugar one of two ways, or you're going to store your sugar. Okay. Um, the ultimate goal of your cell is to take that sugar, that glucose, break it down into carbon dioxide and water, and fuel the phosphorylation of ADP into ATP. Okay? So that's what your cells want to do. They want to break that sugar down, make ATP from it, and then we just have waste products of CO2 and water. Okay. Remember that because CO2 comes in in acid base balance. So this is a really quick and easy way for me to explain what's happening very, very quickly. Gives you a little picture, okay? Starch, um, there is amylase that is made in the salivary glands, produced in the salivary glands. And amylase is an enzyme that breaks down starch. Now, it doesn't break it down one glucose at a time, amylase breaks off the two ends of starch, takes two disaccharides off each end, so they take maltose units off of the large starch molecule. So, the salivary amylase takes off the two disaccharides. So you end up with maltose units, okay, disaccharide. Now, <clears throat> same thing happens when it gets into the gut. If you still have some left, it goes through the GI tract, it goes through the stomach, um, gets into the duodenum. When the pancreas dumps the enzymes into the duodenum, then pancreatic amylase can continue to break that starch down into those disaccharide subunits. Okay, and you end up with maltose again, right? So maltose and maltose, and 
um, in the small intestine, pancreas also makes maltase, which breaks down maltose into glucose and glucose, right? Right? Maltose is glucose and glucose. So the maltase that came from the pancreas is now in your small intestine. Um, and it is breaking down the maltose units, either that came from your saliva breaking, your salivary amylase breaking the starch down, or from the pancreatic amylase breaking the starch down, breaks those maltose disaccharides into glucose monosaccharides. And then that glucose can be absorbed through the intestinal mucosa and go into the bloodstream in the capillaries. Okay? We good? If you don't remember all of this stuff, you might want to go back to your AMP2 stuff because this is pretty much all stuff that we cover in AMP2 with digestion and nutrition and all that. It should have been taken care of. So, <clears throat> what can happen with these glucoses? Okay. Um, if you take in, and I talked about this, if you take in way too much glucose for your body to handle and your cells have taken in as much as they want or need and we still have to store some, then we make glycogen. That is called glycogenesis. Glycogenesis is the production of glycogen or making glycogen. If your cells are going to utilize that glucose and try and break it down so that it can make ATP from it, right? Then that's the, the one called glycolysis. So it's glyco, sugar, lysis, breaking, breaking sugar, breaking sugar, glycolysis. So your glucose gets broken down um, in multiple steps and we form pyruvic acid um, in an anaerobic condition that pyruvic acid will then also be converted into something called lactic acid or lactate. Something we've already talked about once. So what you might not know, okay? I talked about how that glycogen that we store in the liver, when your blood sugar drops, when you haven't eaten for some time, or you've been really busy and you forgot to eat, you, we still need to maintain our body and keep it living and lively and keep the sugar where it needs to be so you're, you don't crash and die, right? So, this thing called glycogenolysis that is on the bottom left hand um, is where we break down glycogen. So lysis means to break, glycogen. So we're breaking the glycogen down into those glucose units, okay? And that's where those glucose units will then be fed into the plasma or the glucose units are going to be used by the muscle cells. Okay. So, glycogen is stored in your muscle cells and it's stored in the liver. So, we need to get it out to the bloodstream if our blood sugar is dropping. That's the liver's issue. You're not going to take the glycogen and break the glycogen that's in your muscle cells down to glucose and put it back out to the bloodstream that way. It, that's the liver sugar. Your muscle cells are going to need that sugar. So if the blood sugar drops, the muscle cells will use their glycogen stored by using the glucose themselves in their own cells. Okay. And there 
there's one more thing that can happen. Um, so, you know that people can survive without food. They can fast for extended periods of time. Um, and as long as they're drinking water and staying hydrated, their body can continue to go on. Now, they can only do this for so long before they're going to die. Some of us, some fluffy people like me, have more reserves than other people. Um, but nonetheless, you can still live for an extended period of time, okay, more than a day, more than two days, living with as long as you are hydrated. How do you do that if you run out of your glucose and you run out of your glycogen stores? Well, your body will actually, liver, liver, has the ability to convert other substances, fatty acids, amino acids, lactic acids, organic acids into glucose when necessary. This is called gluco neo, neo means new, genesis, making new glucoses, gluconeogenesis. So your body actually has the ability to make glucose from other things if absolutely necessary. This is not something I recommend, but if it's a survival thing, your body will survive. Okay. Keep you going so you can get a meal, hopefully. All right. Okay, I am going to stop here. We'll talk about regulation of carbohydrate metabolism and other stuff when I come back tomorrow and do another recording. Okay, have a good one. Enjoy your evening.